Case can be really dangerous to people who aren't properly trained to go into them. It's very unpredictable. Lots of uh, unusual landscapes that you would not possibly imagine looking at a, at a surface feature like this and imagining what is down below there. The Goat Cave got its name because I think when it was first discovered, they found goat bones in here. As a, goats would get too close to the cave opening and fall in or get in and wouldn't be able to get out. That's why a lot of the a lot of the caves, the smaller caves in particular, out on ranch land, the ranchers tended to fill them up and cover them up so that they wouldn't lose their goat or their cattle uh, and have them fall into the cave or break a leg or something. Utilizing the resources, they needed some place to get rid of their trash and holes in the ground it seemed like a reasonable place to try and do it. They just didn't realize it was their own water supply. What we see on some of the walls of Goat Cave here are a lot of speleothems, cave formations that have developed as the water moves through the limestone, dissolving away the calcium carbonate in the limestone. And then as the water enters this open space in here, the pH of that water changes a little bit and allows some of that calcium carbonate to re-precipitate out. So these cave formations begin forming as they drip off the ceiling and over hundreds and thousands and even millions of years grow downward as these drips continue. So what we're seeing here, the water, the rainwater dissolving away the limestone is that same process as acting aquifer wide, creating these large chambers like we're in right now. So protecting Barton Springs means we have to protect the water that enters the aquifer that feeds Barton Springs. And so we have a very large area to try and protect the quality of water that enters the aquifer. Goat Cave is one of many of the hundreds of caves in the Austin area. Uh, it's in a preserve that the city of Austin owns, and it's an excellent example of what a cave or in karst feature is uh, in the Austin area. The roof of this cave is, is kind of like a bowl shaped upwards with the top of it knocked off. That's an example of a collapsed sinkhole where the water table at one point was much higher and as the water table lowered, the roof of the cave was not strong enough to support it and collapsed inward. Somewhere between 85 to 70 million years ago during the Cretaceous period, Austin was covered by a shallow ocean. The result, fossils of aquatic life and shells are found throughout the city. Millions and millions of years ago, you had all these sea creatures living in there, everything from the big dinosaurs that swam to the tiniest little uh, plankton in the ocean. And as they died and settled down, you gradually accumulated these layers of carbonate sediment. This forms the limestone rock of the Edwards Aquifer. So where did all the holes come from? Gradually, over years and years and years, that surface water then cascades into here, recharging the aquifer. That water also serves to enlarge these features over time. The water will dissolve away the limestone, and mechanically some of that water will wash some of that sediment further down into the system. Rainwater is a good solvent since it is slightly acidic from carbon dioxide in the air, which forms carbonic acid. The weak acidic rain dissolves the calcite mineral in limestone over time. Dissolution is an important weathering erosion process, forming recharge features such as caves and sinkholes. Safety first, man. Yeah, it's, it's satisfying work. If you like caves. <laughs> Is, is more of a more immature one. It's not very well developed as a sinkhole, so it may not have been here for a very long time. Uh, how often do you guys clean these holes? Um, Dave and I used to do it about once a year. We'd come out when there's flowing to unplug some of the holes that are plugged up. But nowadays, the land managers have crews and volunteers that do it several times a year. And they come around and, and um, op open some of them up that are new for the first time. These uh, sinkholes have a really great environmental um, impact of allowing the water to go in. And so normally this water would go downstream on Onion Creek, may even cause flooding problems downstream. But if we can restore the creek to allow more of it to go underground, that can supply people who have wells on the aquifer who are relying on the aquifer for their drinking water. And for Barton Springs, so the water can come out support things like the Barton Springs Salamander and people that are swimming in Barton Springs Pool. Um, so the water will sustain for much longer. So we're in Barton Creek and we're close to the Spyglass entrance. 
to the uh, Barton Creek Greenbelt. I study the Edwards Aquifer and the groundwater resources of the Austin area. The fractures are a linear feature in the rock. This can allow water to move from the creek and down into the aquifer. And so if you walk down Barton Creek, you can see these linear features. Where they intersect is also an indication uh, that they're probably recharging. And you can just see these expressed in the creek bed throughout this area. Um, in 1999, we did a dye trace study and we poured dye into Barton Creek about two miles upstream of here. That dye actually made it to Barton Springs in 10 hours. It traveled 1.8 miles in 10 hours. These fractures are, in fact, recharge features. Today we're in an abandoned rock quarry just south of Austin. And the advantage of being in a rock quarry is that you get to see the layers of rock that underlie the ground that are normally out of sight. What you see behind me are layers of limestone that from what we know of studying the fossils in them and the texture of those rocks, that this area was once a very shallow sea. And in fact, most of the continental United States, the inland continental United States was a shallow sea back in the Cretaceous era when these rocks were deposited. The layers of rock correspond to some of the different environments that were in that ocean at the time and how those environments changed. Millions of years ago, Earthquakes rumbled throughout central Texas. Over time, as the tectonic forces in the earth shifted and, and, and adjusted, there was so much force in some areas that the rocks actually broke, creating some of the faults, like you see behind me, and some of the fractures. And when a fault moves, we call that an earthquake because there is so much energy released when that fault moves that the earth actually shakes and quakes and, and creates these ripples of energy that move outward from where the where the the fault moves. The limestone shelf, which had been long buried by soil layers, was pushed to the surface. The harder layers maybe be in higher energy environments where you didn't have the deposition of much fine sediment. The softer layers have more clay and formed rock rather than sediment. Hard rock is something that's a very valuable commodity in our civilization, which is why there are a number of quarries in central Texas in particular that mine this very hard rock of the Edwards. Hard rock is hard to come by and makes the Edwards rock that is very hard that much more valuable. <laughs>